What's up, everybody? Welcome to Family Church Online. My name is Oscar. I'm the campus pastor in Whittier. It's so great to have you with us wherever you happen to be watching from. Today, we're going to be concluding the series of messages that we've been in for the last five weeks called Follow Me, where we've been talking about what it means to be true followers of Jesus, which we actually defined as someone who lives according to God's word and his ways. If this is your first time with us, or maybe it's your first time in a long time, that definition by itself probably sounds super broad and general, maybe even a little intimidating. So I'd encourage you to go back and watch some of the previous messages from this series because each week what we did was we unpacked different principles that have not only helped us to understand that definition better, but also how to live it out. Because when it comes to following Jesus, one of the things that we talked about is not about how much you know, it's about how much you live out. This whole series uh, is inspired by a passage in Matthew chapter 4 where Jesus has started recruiting what we now know as his 12 disciples. These 12 young guys who even though uh, they had some similarities, they're pretty different. Most scholars believe that they were anywhere from 13 years old to 30, which that in and of itself is a huge difference. Like they were in completely different stages of life. There were, so, there were probably some super awkward conversations at first, like when they all first got together. And that's not even a knock on the 13 year olds because I've honestly met some really awkward 30 year olds. They had jobs like fishermen and tax collectors. Some were related, others barely knew each other. Some were educated and wealthy, others weren't. But despite all their differences, they had one very important thing in common, world-changing faith. And we see Jesus call them to follow him and to leave everything behind to pursue a greater purpose for their lives, and then they do. And as a result, these young guys from different walks of life ended up changing the world. Like me standing here talking to you today is a result of their faith. How many of you know that faith can change the world. And later on, we see in Matthew 17, 20, Jesus is giving them this lesson in faith, and he says, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. God wants to do the impossible in our lives. There's mountains in our lives that when words of faith are spoken over them, they have no choice but to move seemingly impossible situations that are going to lead us to seeing God move in miraculous ways, mountain-moving situations that are going to lead to unbelievable moments in our lives. Sometimes when I'm reading stories in the Bible, I find myself saying, no way, like that's unbelievable. Stories of people having so much faith in Jesus that they just touch his clothes as he's like walking by and they're healed. Unbelievable stories of God's power. Have you ever heard a story that was just so shocking that it's unbelievable? I worked in retail at Nordstrom for over seven years, and over that time I compiled some unbelievable stories. One of the most unbelievable ones actually has to do with me. We were crazy busy, and I was helping like three people at once. And for some reason, my belt was loose. And uh, my pants had slipped a little as I was bringing like five shoe boxes out for this mom and her daughter. And then when I went to set the boxes down, I did like this hard squat. And I just hear this ripping noise. My pants ripped right in front of the customer. Like that, and that's not even the most unbelievable part, okay? The most unbelievable part is that I happened to be in the middle of wash cycles that day. So I'm just going to leave that there. I, I squat down and I hear this rip and I'm thinking in my head, no, no way. Like this isn't happening. This is all in your head. And I look down and I'm like, oh, excuse me. I ran to the back. I called my wife to come and staple my pants just so that I could get out of the building so that I could go home. And as if things couldn't get any worse, when she's stapling them, I realized my pants had ripped from the front all the way to the back. So everyone who watched me run to the back got this show. Every time I tell this story, people are like, no way, I don't believe it. You're exaggerating. Well, unfortunately, I've got like over 20 people who can say that I'm not. Like, it was unbelievable. I believe that as followers of Jesus, our lives should be full of unbelievable mountain-moving stories. When people hear us talk about times that we prayed for something and God responded, that they should say, no way. How's that possible? That's unbelievable. Some of you are probably thinking, 
how can you be so confident about this, all this? Well, Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us that now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we don't see. What are you hoping for that you don't see? Is it physical healing, relational healing, freedom from addiction, financial breakthrough, spiritual revival in your home? Whatever it is, it's time to come to God with a faith that believes that he is who he says he is. It's time to develop this world-changing faith that the disciples had. And I know that the word faith can have different meanings for different people, so to make sure that we're all on the same page, we're going to define faith as a complete trust in the power, wisdom, and goodness of God. If we have a complete trust in the power, wisdom, and goodness of God, then we can be confident in any situation. And I believe God will honor that, and we're going to see lives transformed and the world changed. So with the rest of our time together, I want to share three things that are required to develop a world-changing faith that can be seen uh, in this pretty well-known story about Peter, who's one of the 12 disciples. But before we jump into the story, I want to give you a little context about him that I feel is important for you to know. So he's one of the older of the 12 disciples in that 13 to 30 range. He's actually married, which makes the fact that he left his career uh, as a fisherman to follow Jesus for three years an even bigger faith move. Like, guys, could you just imagine coming home, telling your wife you're quitting your job to follow this awesome guy that people are calling the Messiah because he says that there's a bigger purpose for your life? I don't know how well that would go over for me, but he did it. He was bold and he was outspoken. And so it's no surprise that he was looked at as kind of the unofficial leader of their group. He's mentioned more times in the New Testament than all the other disciples combined. He's Jesus' best friend, one of his best friends. He played a cr crucial role in getting the church started after Jesus went back to heaven, especially in Rome. And so a lot of people considered him to kind of be the first pope. He was so bold and on fire for Jesus that at the end of his life, he was crucified by this Christian-hating jerk named Nero, and, and he told Nero that he didn't deserve to die in the same way that Jesus did, and so he asked to be crucified upside down. He had a world-changing faith. But he wasn't always like that. In the beginning, he was impulsive, and he didn't respond well under pressure. And we see this specifically in the story about him in Matthew chapter 14 that I feel most of us can relate to. At least I know I can. See, Jesus had just finished feeding the 5,000, and he tells his disciples, hey, you guys, you guys go on ahead. I'll catch up. So they get on a boat. They head out to the lake. And the Bible says that the boat was quite a bit away from the shore at this point because the wind was so strong, it was making waves. So Jesus starts walking on water towards them. They get freaked out when they see him because they thought it was this ghost. They don't understand what's happening. And so they start screaming like little girls, like, I swear, it's in the Bible. Read it for yourself. Jesus says, hey, stop freaking out. It's me. And Peter says, if it's really you, prove it. Tell me to come to you. Then Peter gets out of the boat. He starts walking on the water to Jesus. Everything's going fine until he just starts to look around and, and he sees the waves and he feels the wind on his face and all around him. His circumstances, that chaos that's all around him, caused his faith to decrease. And then he starts sinking. And so he cries out and he asks Jesus to save him. The Bible says that immediately Jesus reached down to save him. So the first thing that we see in the story that's required to develop a world-changing faith is focus. Whatever we choose to focus on is going to reveal where our faith is. Hebrews 12.2 says, let us keep looking to Jesus. Our faith comes from him. He's the one who makes it perfect. Peter was in the midst of chaos, but he's also in the middle of a miracle. See, if he would have continued to focus on Jesus, he would have been able to see the miracle play out. But instead, he chose to focus on the storm, and then he began to sink. This has been me so many times in my life where like, I choose to focus on my problems instead of God. What, what he's actually doing, in the middle, even in the middle of the storm, my eyes go off of God and, and onto my problems. We can choose to focus on the storm and the struggle, or we can choose to focus on our great God. When we choose to magnify God, that's when miracles happen. So if we want to develop this world-changing faith, we have to keep our focus 
on God. Romans 10, 17 tells us how we can do that. It says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Spend time with God and let God become your focus. And your problems and the storm around you are just going to become background noise. You're going to hear his voice louder than the, the issues in the storm. And when you hear his voice through his word, your faith will begin to increase. Second thing required to develop a world-changing faith is fighting. The Apostle Paul encourages young protege Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.12 to fight the good fight of faith. Because Peter was human, just like us, I know he had to fight a few things in that story. And they're the same things that we're all going to have to fight to develop this world-changing faith. The first thing he had to fight was fear. Sometimes when God begins to speak to us about doing anything, and anything that might be big, fear is going to try to stop us from taking that step of faith. The phrase fear not is, it's used 365 times in the Bible. And I think that's because God knew that we would need that daily reminder in our lives to not be afraid. Matthew 14, 30 says, But when he, Peter, saw the wind, he was afraid, and he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. See, fear is one of the biggest threats to our faith. And what I've noticed is that a lot of the times the area where we fear the most is the area we trust God the least. There's always going to be this tension between your fear and your faith. Anytime you step out in faith, you're going to have to step over fear to do it. And it's not wrong to feel fear, but it's wrong to follow fear. If you follow fear, you'll never end up where God wants you to be, or it's just going to take way longer than it should have. What's always been so crazy to me about this story of Peter walking on water is that Jesus was with Peter right in front of him the whole time. He's within, within arm distance of Peter, and yet the storm around him overshadowed his faith. He promised to never leave us or forsake us, and that means that he's always with us. That should make our fear decrease and our faith increase. What has God called you to do that has you scared right now? It's time to step out in faith. The second thing that he had to fight was facts. See, Jesus called Peter to do something, but the facts were that it was humanly impossible. Look, if you step out of a boat onto water, you're going to sink. Like Those are the facts. No one had ever done it before, and no one has ever done it since. There's going to be times where you're going to have to fight to make sure that our faith, your faith, isn't shaken by the facts. And this is really hard for us detail-oriented people who naturally only see things logically, right? But 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we live by faith, not by sight. Because we live by faith, the real facts are what God says about it. Maybe you're tired of being in the red every month and the facts are that you need a financial miracle. But well, we serve a God who supplies all of our needs. Maybe you're stuck in some form of addiction and your father was an addict and his father was an addict and the facts are that there's no hope for you. But the Bible says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The real fact is that no matter what you're going through, God has the final word. Depression doesn't get the, the last word. Cancer doesn't get the last word. Divorce, abuse, addiction, hopelessness, brokenness, even death doesn't get the last word because Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave. Nothing is impossible. The third thing that Peter had to fight was feelings. A lot of the times, our feelings are going to try to contradict our faith. I'm sure on some level, Peter didn't even feel like walking on water, right? It's, it's cold. It'd been a really long day. Like, they just literally fed thousands of people. But could you imagine what your life would be like if you only did the things that you felt like doing? Like, sometimes I don't feel like taking a shower or brushing my teeth or even being nice to people. It's true. Like, I have to fight those feelings almost daily or else I'm just going to be dirty, stinky, and angry all the time. I don't always feel God's presence, but I need to keep walking by faith anyways. Sometimes I feel depressed, but by faith, I'm going to keep moving forward. Sometimes it feels like God is taking a really long time to fulfill his promises in my life. It feels like he's forgotten about me. We need to fight to be driven by our world-changing faith and not our feelings. 
The fourth thing I believe that Peter had to fight is failure. See, Peter had only been following Jesus for a couple years at this point, but he already had some significant fails under his belt. Like he was notorious for putting his foot in his mouth, so impulsive. So when it came time to take this big step of faith, I'm sure all of these failures just came rushing to his mind. Sometimes our enemy will try to discourage us by putting lies in our mind. God's never gonna use you. God's never gonna bless you. After everything you've done, like it's over, just give up. And when that happens, we need to shift our thoughts with the truth of God's word. Philippians 1.6 says, Being confident of this, that he who, t- who started this good work in you will carry it out until the completion, until Christ comes back. Can I just remind you that God doesn't change? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if God promised that he, what he started he'd finished, then that promise still stands. God, God doesn't change. We change. God doesn't quit. We quit. Some of you need to get this in your spirit. You need to hear this, you need to write it down, and you need to keep it somewhere where you can see it everywhere. Failure doesn't define you. Failure doesn't even dictate your future, but your response to it does. If you don't quit, you win. Uh, Let me just remind you of the failures of some of these amazing men and women of God. Noah was a drunk, Jacob was a liar, Rahab was a prostitute, David was an adulterer and a murderer, Moses was also a murderer. Thomas was a doubter. This is a list of some incredible people who didn't let their failures derail their faith, and they changed the world because of it. The best is yet to come, and God isn't finished with you yet. Developing this world-changing faith requires focus, fighting, and lastly, forward movement. See, faith is an action. As you step out in faith, as you step onto the waters, your faith is going to grow. Action creates confidence. When I was little, I was obsessed with this movie, Three Ninjas. I I must have watched it like hundreds of times. I watched it so much that I actually thought that I could fight. Then I joined this karate class to get my butt kicked. But as I kept practicing, my confidence began to grow. See, faith only builds and develops as you repeatedly step out and use it. I I built uh, my faith up through repetition. The more you step out, and exercise that complete trust in the power, wisdom, and goodness of God, the more it grows. What are you repeating? Are you taking steps of faith regularly? The the more you do, and you see God come through, the more your faith is gonna grow. James 2.17 says that faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. So move forward. Start sharing your faith with people who are around you. Go to starting point and start serving the church. Join a community group. Start tithing. Start that business that God put in your heart that you've been talking yourself out of. What has God called you to do? Whatever he's called you to do, he's already equipped you to do it. You probably just don't realize it because you haven't stepped out yet to do it. Move forward. Do great things for God. Our God didn't give us a small commission. He gave us a great commission that everyone would know him, that the gospel would be preached around the world, When God looks at our church, I want him to be amazed at our faith because I believe with all my heart in the next year, our God wants to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ask, think, or imagine according to the power at work in the church so that he would be glorified for generations to come. At Family Church, we have a world-changing faith because our faith is in Jesus, the only one worthy of our complete trust. If you're watching today and you're tired of falling short because you've, you've been putting your faith in all the wrong things. If you're ready to put your complete trust in the power, wisdom, and goodness of God by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, would you pray with me? Wherever you are, just, just repeat this after me. Jesus, I believe you're God. I believe you died and rose again so that I could be forgiven and have a new life. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your spirit so that I can know you, love like you, and serve you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer for the first time or you recommitted your life to Jesus, we just want to say congratulations on making the most important decision of your life. The Bible says that all of heaven right now is rejoicing for you. And as your church family, 
we join in on that celebration, we would just ask that you would take the next step and let us know about this decision. All you have to do is click the link to let us know. One of our team members will reach out so that we can partner with you on this journey of following Jesus because commitment lasts longer in community and it's just way more fun to do things together as a family. We love you, church.